My name is Dr. Sarah Jarvis. I'm a general practitioner, and I'm joined by a panel of experts, both male, I'm delighted to say, and female. So we have some gender equality going on across our panel as well. So I'm very pleased to introduce Juan Antonio Garcia Valesco. He is professor and medical director at IVI RMA Madrid in Spain. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Christophe Blochin who is Professor and Medical Director at the Centre for Reproductive Medicine at UZ in Brussels. Welcome to you too. Elisa, <coughs> who is here with two hats on in two capacities, but mostly she is here to represent the patient. She is, however, Associate Professor in Gynaecology at the same place, IVI RMA in Zaragoza, Spain, uh, but she uh, is giving us the patient perspective because she has undertaken egg freezing not once, but twice, with great success, I think, as she will tell us. And Joyce is the Professor of Reproductive Science and Head of the Research Department of Reproductive Health, all those things at UCL, um, at the Institute for Women's Health in the UK. She is passionate about empowering women and about working. She's been working in the fields of IVF and reproductive genetics since 1987 for 32 years, almost exactly the same length of time as I've worked as a GP. So today we're going to be discussing fertility preservation among women and in particular egg freezing and the freeze all strategy, which is a very new concept. And I know that Christoph is going to be taking us through what that means. But we're also going to be looking at Gideon Richter's fertility preservation campaign across Europe, which is called Be Ready Whenever You're Ready. I think it sums it up just beautifully. And following the presentations from our speakers, we will provide an opportunity for you to ask questions. So I'm now going to hand over to our first speaker, Juan Antonio Garcia Valesco. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this session about freezing. Basically, to understand how IVF works and is successful, we have to combine three things. We have to generate the embryos. To generate the embryos, we have to stimulate the ovaries with hormones that sometimes will affect the endometrial receptivity. The endometrial receptivity is the, is the inside of the uterus of the womb that where the embryos should implant. And also, we have to transfer uh, the embryo inside this uterus. And we know from a few years ago that stimulating the ovaries may have an impact on this receptivity. So ideally, we could separate these two things. First, generate the embryos and then um, transfer them, but we need to freeze them. So this has been uh, this has been possible basically because there's a huge change in the way we freeze the embryos. Before that, uh, all sites was not very successful in the freezing um, process, and then lately vitrification came into place in 2006, 2007. Vitrification is ultra rapid freezing, so that be gave us the opportunity to have more or less the same success with fresh and frozen. And it changed completely the way the way we practice today. Actually, it became almost like a fever, not a Disney fever, but a, a, an embryo or also frozen <laughs> fever. So, <clears throat> words are very important when we talk about freezing. Um, Professor Blokil, Christophe, will speak later on the medical indications of freezing, and I will concentrate on the non-medical freezing. And, and I insist on the words, because the words that we use and the words that you use may make a difference and may have an impact. Uh, social freezing has a slightly negative connotation. Social doesn't seem to be justified. Medical seems justified. And, and social freezing is actually non-medical, but it's required also because of aging, as we will see and as we, we are hearing, because aging produces diseases. Aging causes um, diabetes, Alzheimer, and infertility. So if we concentrate in this picture, look at the, at the large red arrow in the middle of the screen, fertility <coughs> starts to decline in the mid-30s, early 30s, and when you're 40, 42, fertility is gone. And this is when we see our patients. Patients come in the late 30s, early 40s, and it's way too late to start thinking about the starting a family. Look at this picture. Maybe you've read this article. It's the front page of a business magazine uh, a few years ago. This lady wrote an article showing that by every year that you postpone maternity, you increase your salary by 10%. That's a very dangerous message. So this is the society that we have today. This is what we get. In 2019, we see uh, this in the, in the newspaper. Uh, low birth rates challenge southern Europe. We know in some parts of the world we're having less and less babies. 
look at this table with uh, European leaders, you have uh, Macron, Merkel, Theresa May, Jean-Claude Juncker. They have one thing in common. None of them have babies. No, none of them have kids. Maybe they tried, we don't know, but maybe for some of them it was not the priority. Look at the mean age at first birth. This is Spain, this is my country. From the 70s until today, it keeps increasing every year. And just by nature, at some point, it will stop, it will plateau, but it keeps increasing every year. We are now at 32 years is the mean age of the first birth. And the problem is that <clears throat> when you age, your oocytes are uh, not so many and not so good. Not so good meaning that the oocyte that you produce when you are 38, 40, 42, they may have chromosomal abnormalities and they may uh, yield uh, abnormal or unhealthy babies or have any scarlet. So what, what do patients know and what do doctors know? And, and patients know little because they have had no previous education. This should be taught in school, but it's not uh, being said. And they always tend to overestimate their chances of having a baby at any age. And doctors as well have very little knowledge. In general, <clears throat> even if they are uh, specialists, that's what they learned when they were specialists in, in the medical school. But they complain basically about the lack of training and the lack of time. Lack of training in this particular topic, and lack of time to explain this and discuss with, with patients, and they will have to answer difficult questions that sometimes they have to have the proper training. Is this procedure risky for the mother? I think today uh, is almost risk-free, and we will hear later about how this has been done. Is it risky for the newborns? There's plenty of evidence out there showing that you have no more or no less malformations in the babies that are born from fresh oocytes or frozen oocytes. What about cost-effectiveness? And this is a, a difficult question, because if you want to get good eggs, you should freeze when you're very young. But if you freeze when you're too young, most of these women will have babies on their own. They will not need IVF to have a baby. So you will freeze a lot of eggs that will never be used. If you freeze too late, the oocytes will be of very poor quality. So the sweet spot should be between 30 and 35. This is the time that if you are not planning to have a family mm -hmm. uh, in the next few years, you should discuss this with your counselors. Look at the success rates. Look how important is aging in the outcome. In the blue line, you can see the outcome for women who froze the eggs under 35. This is data from our institution published last year. You see that the, the more oocytes that you freeze, the better the success rates. In green, you have exactly the same, um, <coughs> the same data, but in women who froze the oocytes over 35. So you can see that it's almost half the success rate. So the younger, the better. So then why don't all women freeze? And I think this is a, a very nice analogy that was published in an editorial a few years ago. Sometime. Comparing what, what the pill offered women in the 60s to what uh, freezing could offer today to women. In the 60s, the pill offered women to separate sexual life from reproduction, and it was a huge uh, step forward. And it may be that uh, vitrification could separate reproduction from aging, and instead of having this huge pressure on top of the shoulders, they could decide when they want to have a baby. So <clears throat> my final uh, message is that we need to manage patient expectations. First, we have to educate our patients with the information that we just discussed about the impact of aging. Second, we have to remember that, that we are freezing all sides. We're giving them we're giving them an option, an opportunity. We're not freezing babies. So if you freeze three oocytes, you are not going to have three babies. We have to be very clear with the with information because this is a beautiful opportunity that they, they could have if they need it. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for a wonderful, broad, but very powerful introduction to the stark facts of what's happening out there in terms of the choices women are making, but also to the opportunities. And speaking of opportunities, I would now like to welcome Christoph Blochiel, and he is going to tell us about that key ICFO paper. Recently, we um, wrote a paper about uh, the freeze-all strategy, and the title was should we still perform fresh embryo transfer? So it is my privilege to, uh, to guide you through the, the pros and the cons and, uh, and everything what we know about freeze all strategies because we have always been concentrating on, first of all, avoiding multiple pregnancies and performing the single embryo transfers. Secondly, enemy number one, or the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, 
should be avoided by all means. But nowadays, we are more and more into the uh, increment, increasing the live birth rates. We want people to go home with a healthy singleton baby in the vast majority of the cases. And one of those strategies could be the freeze-all strategy. First, we need to come to an agreement about how we are going to name this because some of us are talking about freeze for all or freeze only, but maybe it's better to stick to the freeze all strategy that encompasses all strategies of freezing the available embryos or uh, oocytes. And let us maybe start with the non-elective indications, indications that are taken along the ovarian stimulation or at the end of the ovarian stimulation. And this is number one. It's OHSS or the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, still the major complication in assisted reproductive technologies. So we should avoid that by all means because still today there is an underestimation of the incidence of these severe complications. We don't want our patients to come in the hospital completely healthy and then go out uh, in a um, sick way, let us say. And a way to avoid this is to provide a conventional, I don't say wild, but a conventional stimulation using the GnRH antagonist protocol to trigger final oocyte maturation with the GnRH agonist and then foresee a freeze-all strategy by vitrifying, as Juan was just telling us, vitrifying all the oocytes of the embryos. A second non-elective indication is the progesterone rise, because if the progesterone is rising at the end of the follicular phase, then it has an impact on the outcome. And there are several publications, many, many publications, stating that indeed, this elevated progesterone plays a role at the end of the follicular phase. Pregnancy rates are significantly decreased. So another indication to freeze <coughs> all. And then there is also some elective indications, indications that we can decide prior to the start of the IVF treatment. And the first one is PGT. PGT, or pre-implantation genetic testing, is a technique, is an embryo biopsy analysis that is gaining popularity. More and more centers are performing the PGT uh, analysis using, in most of the cases, the NGS or next generation, <coughs> next generation sequencing. And it offers very nice results. But the problem, if we can call it like that, is that it requires overnight analysis. So this is why we should freeze. And based on this prospective randomized trial, it shows that when performing a freeze-all in PGT, that it also offers a uh, significantly higher number of uh, pregnancies. So this is interesting. What about patients who do not get preg uh, pregnant after three consecutive failed IVF attempts with good quality embryos, the repeated failed implantation? Should we maybe freeze those embryos? Well, there is some data. <coughs> some data, this is a prospective study, but there is no randomized controlled trials uh, to date. But this study already shows a significant impact, positive impact, when using the freeze-all strategy as compared with the fresh. There is some other indications. We know endometriosis or <coughs> the presence of this estrogen-dependent disease, the presence of endometrium or lining of the womb outside the uterus. Well, there is some data, although retrospective, that it might have a benefit to freeze. The same for adenomyosis. We are a bit underestimating the incidence of adenomyosis. And also there, very few data available. We should really uh, motivate people to do some randomized trials in adenomyosis, but there also they might have, there might be a positive impact of adenomyosis on the outcome when freezing. And then finally, the embryo pooling, uh, the repeated ovarian stimulations in people who are poor responders, 
poor responders, patients who obtain only two or three eggs uh, following ovarian stimulation, there might be a, a benefit in, in terms of lowering the dropout rates if we do consecutive attempts of ovarian stimulation. It also accumulates number of oocytes, so the chance, the likelihood of obtaining a beautiful and even euploid embryo at the end of the day is increasing. What are the disadvantages of the freeze-all strategy? Are there any disadvantages? Well, maybe yes, because the time to pregnancy is of course prolonged. If we transfer three or five days following an oocyte retrieval, or if we need to freeze and then start an next attempt, we are losing some time because our patients, they want to get pregnant tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And this is why we did the study. We said, well, let us maybe have a look at our patients who start immediately. So no menstrual cycle between oocyte retrieval and then the preparation of the frozen embryo transfer versus a delay of at least one or two months because you know you need to recover now. You have stimulate, stimulated the ovaries, you should recover a little bit, you need to wait a couple of months prior to the treatment. Is that the reality? Well, no, because we have observed, although retrospective, we have observed that when going immediately to the frozen embryo <coughs> transfer, that it could even give higher pregnancy rates as compared with delaying with an Let's, let's say taking a pause of one, two, or even three cycles. This is what interests us most, and this has already been uh, pointed by uh, Dr. Garcia Velasco. What do we see with regard to the babies? Well, when using the freeze-all strategy, there is less small for gestational age babies. So we have less complications with regard to that category of patients less uh, premature birth, less prematurity. But on the other hand, with the freeze-all, we see an increased incidence of large for gestational babies. And this we need to be very cautious with because both two small babies and two large babies, babies can carry risks. So important to do more studies on the follow-up and the outcome of the children. So if I can conclude, Freeze all for everybody? Well, maybe not, but certainly for patients who are at risk for the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, patients with polycystic ovaries, for example, patients who uh, have elevated progesterone at the end of the ovarian stimulation, patients undergoing PGT, and then we really need more data with regard to the other indications. Thank you so much. Christoph, thank you so much. So we've drilled down beautifully into the freeze-all strategy. Now let's ask Joyce Harper, our next speaker, to move on and talk to us about that concept of freeze-all, or at least the concept of non-medical egg freezing and how viable it is. Thank you, Sarah. So how viable is egg freezing? Uh, just some disclosures. And my experience of the last 30 years of working in this field is I want everyone who wants to have children to be able to have children and I myself went through five years of fertility treatment and almost didn't succeed and I know what it's like to be infertile so I do not want women and men to have to go through these complicated treatments to try and have their family so I'm going to talk about female fertility decline some data on natural and IVF pregnancy rates, why are women delaying having children, and obviously tell you about egg freezing and the work I've been doing over the last three years about fertility education. So we have a problem with a woman's biology. The quantity and quality of our eggs declines daily. And it all starts when we're a fetus in our mother's st stomach, in our, ut in our uterus, we have, at that time, when we are a fetus, about seven million eggs. But unfortunately, by the time a woman is born, the majority of those have died. So we're now born with about one to two million eggs at birth. And then by puberty, we've again lost 
a huge amount of them, we have only about half a million eggs left at puberty. And from puberty to the, to the menopause, we lose about 25 to 30 eggs per day. So we only ovulate one, normally, one viable egg per month. About 1,000 roughly die each month. And by the age of 37, 90% of a woman's eggs have gone. And at the menopause, we have no viable eggs left. We do have a few actual eggs left, but they are no longer viable. So over our lifetime, a woman will only ovulate about 500 eggs. In a man's single ejaculate, he has about 100 million sperm. <laughs> so we have the biggest gender inequality if we just look at our eggs and our sperm. So it's not, unfortunately, just about quantity. It's also about quality. And there are several reasons, but it's mainly to do with the chromosomes. And I'm not going into any technical genetics today. Just to say that the chromosomes in the eggs from puberty to the menopause become very confused. And this graph we can see here is a of standard graph that we talk about fertility decline fertility declining as a woman ages, this age at the bottom, and our chance of spontaneous miscarriage or spontaneous abortion will increase because of those chromosomes being very abnormal as, as a woman gets older and it results in miscarriage and other issues. And we did mention earlier the age of 35, and that's really the crucial age we can see on this graph and when we've really got to be thinking about female fertility decline. A lot of people think in vitro fertilization or IVF is the answer. I've heard many women say, but I can just go and have IVF. It's going to be fine. It will make me pregnant, but it doesn't work miracles. This is Louise Brown, the world's first IVF baby. Last year, she had a very busy year. It was her 40th <coughs> birthday, and she was everywhere. She was even at the ESHRA conference last year, having about a million photos taken. So in those 41 years now, we have achieved quite a lot, and we now have egg freezing, but we cannot work miracles. And I'm going to show you now the USA and UK data for IVF live birth rate. And we can see here that under the age of 35 is how the data is, is uh, collated. And it's collated under 35 as the first column because between that age, if it's 28 or 32, we don't see a significant difference in live birth rate. But after 35, things are rapidly declining, and this is why we see everything bunched in a few years. And in the USA data, they put everything over 40 together, and it's just a few percent chance of achieving a pregnancy. This is a key fact that we need to educate men and women about. The UK data, this is the uh, same sort of story. Um, the two bars are just different years, um, and we see the same thing. The UK bunched the data 34 and under, and then in two to three year batches, and we can see over 40, it's really just a few percent. But we have another problem. We've already talked about, you talked about Spain, about the increase in the age women are having children. This is some global data. The white triangles are the data from 1995, and we can see the blue columns, which are 2015. There has been an increase in the age women give birth in every single country. And I mentioned Greece earlier. Um, Greece is one of the highest uh, rates of um, first birth. And this is going to probably still carry on increasing um, over the next few years. So why do women delay having children? Why, why are they doing this? Well, why not? We lead very different lives now to our parents and our grandparents. We now have many choices. And we've already discussed today about not finding the right partner. So finding a partner who is ready to commit to having children, I think is really the major issue that many women have today. Education, we can be educated, we can have our wonderful careers, we can travel the world, we can enjoy our social life. And I put financial at the bottom. I think many people always talk about, I don't, can't afford to have a child. It's, it's a question that's always there. But I think with regards to egg freezing, it's these other issues that have really become paramount.
So I'm looking at good advice to the 30 year old woman. And I say 30 because 30 is really, in my view, the age that a woman needs to seriously make some decisions. Decide if she wants to have children or if she <gasps> might want to have children. And in my view, she's got three options if she does. She could start trying now and this will be a problem if she doesn't have a partner or a partner who will commit. So there is a growing amount of solo motherhood where a woman is using a sperm donor. And the recent data from the HFEA, who govern IVF in the UK, has shown an increase in women that are using sperm donor without a partner. They could decide to wait until they feel ready. <laughs> And that is fine as long as they are fully informed about these issues that I've been talking about. So they make that informed choice. And what we're discussing today, she could decide to freeze her eggs. Um, this is me in Madrid um, earlier this year, talking to a group of women, career women in their early 30s, some with partners, some without. They all wanted to have children and none of them felt they were ready for various reasons. Um, and it's, this is a common occurrence when you speak to women of this age. I'm actually writing a book um, about the good advice to the 30-year-old woman and helping women understand how their fertility works, their fertile window, menstrual cycle, etc. If we're not taught this information, how are we supposed to know this? So freezing eggs, the procedure's only been a viable procedure for about 12 or 13 years. And it was the groundbreaking work from various labs, including Laura Rienzi and Anna Kobo, who looked at the efficiency of this new procedure, vitrification. The egg is a very large cell. And if we try to freeze it, it can get ice crystals in the egg, which can destroy it. But vitrifications proved very successful. And in 2012, the American Society said that this procedure is no longer experimental. <coughs> and this was a review that we wrote a few years ago. So that's great news. But there are some issues that we need to think about. We need to think about the cost. It is an expensive procedure. It varies in different European countries. I know Spain's very reasonable. In the UK, there are some women paying up to about 15,000 pounds for two or three cycles of egg freezing. This is some data that Anna Kobo sent me, looking at the success. Women do obviously want to know how successful. And Anna's work has showed this is fresh and frozen. Um, with the blue and uh, red, red line, they are almost identical. We say now that freezing your eggs is going to give you the same success as fresh. Now, we have done a study recently with De Montfort University. It was a questionnaire of women that had frozen their eggs to find out some of the information about their motivation and attitude. And these blue graphs show that the majority of women are freezing their eggs because they're single, and the age that women are freezing their eggs, they are mainly over 35 years of age. And the bottom graph is the data from our Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, also showing that in the UK, the majority of women freezing their eggs are over 35. And this is not a good situation. Remember, those eggs quality and quantity will decrease over 35. And unfortunately, in some countries, including the UK, some people have decided that there is a 10-year storage limit on any frozen eggs. And to, to me, this is crazy. A man in the UK who has a vasectomy can store his sperm for 55 years. A woman who wants to freeze her eggs can freeze them for 10 years. This is, this is insane, it's a crazy rule, but we're not the only country that has this, but we are fighting very hard to get this overturned because this means a woman of 25 who freezes her eggs would have to use them by 35. That doesn't work. And we want to encourage people, and some women are delaying freezing their eggs until they're older because of this 10-year rule, which is a disaster. They can have egg donation at up to her 40s, but not this. 
So the advantages and disadvantages of social or non-medical um, egg freezing, the advantages are it removes the biological clock, it gives women control over their fertility and their lives. There's no need to put their career on hold, no rush to find a partner, reduces the need for IVF when they are older, because they will have those young eggs frozen, and it reduces the risk of the chromosome abnormalities. But there are disadvantages which we have to inform women about. It is not a guarantee of a baby. There is little data on success. We have data about fresh and frozen, but not about these women coming back to use these eggs. I really think women need to be under 35. It is expensive. The IVF is a difficult procedure to go through. And when do we transfer these embryos? We need to think about women who might want to have children past their 50s and there are obstetric risks and it would not be recommended to transfer embryos into women over 50. And this 10-year storage limit is really an issue in a number of countries. So the best chance is to have children when they are young. So just to finish off, I co-founded the Fertility Education Initiative in the UK three years ago with Adam Balin, and we are very passionate about ensuring everybody, including health professionals, teachers, parents, children, adults, understand the information I've just been telling you. So we've done a number of studies. We've been looking at how we can use art to educate children to try and captivate their attention. We've done a lot of things in the media, on television. We've made some animations to help deliver these messages. But I think our most important success is our Department of Education in the UK now has this line. It says that we need to educate on the facts about reproductive health, including fertility and the potential impact of lifestyle on fertility for men and women. And this is where we are working at the moment. So in conclusion, this is my master's students at their graduation. We have a lot of women in our, on our course. Is there advice once they've graduated to visit the fertility clinic to have their eggs frozen? I think that's something we should discuss today. So we need to think about education of men and women. We need to inform women of the facts. It is their individual choice what they do with that information. But we need to get talking and we need to try and improve work the work environment and childcare to <coughs> readdress the balance and try and stop those those graphs of age at first birth going up and up and we do not want to be like this woman oh my god i forgot to have children <laughs> so this is my team and i'm very active on social media and we often discuss egg freezing so please follow it's prof joyce harper thank you what a great summary of the current situation and, of course, where we need to think about going next. I don't think there's any question that your passion for education, A, shone through, and B, that you have persuaded everybody in this room <laughs> that it's so important, Joyce. But somebody who was educated and, indeed, having been the ultimate educated patient, has made that decision herself. Professor Elisa Gilarabas is now going to take us through the patient perspective on the importance of managing expectations and responsible education. Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to talk after these three big, great speakers. And I'm talking from the point of view of the patient, even I'm a doctor specialized in fertility. Um, well, the first thing I want to do is to show this slide, who, which has been published in my country many days ago, and it is amazing. Um, the slide says that there are more pets, more dogs than children below 15 in our country. So, well, we have a problem maybe. We have to think about this. The main reason, it has been already said, the main reason is that women have delayed our maternity and now almost in Spain we have just one, 1 1.1 children by woman. So it is clear that family model has changed a lot. We have children very late, we have few children, 
we bring them up in another way. And this is a big opportunity for us and for our children, but it is also a problem. Maybe in many years, we will not have nobody who cares about us. So, well, it is a moment to think about it. I want to introduce myself. This is me. I'm a 38-year-old white Caucasian woman. I'm doctor in medicine and in surgery. I'm specialized in gynecology and obstetrics, and I work in fertility field since 2010. I have no children now, and I have no dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a lot of opportunities because I have petrified my eggs twice. One day in consulta, when I was working, I realized that I was older than my own patients. And I said, oh, oh, I have a problem. It was a point, an inflection point in that moment. And that day, I also discovered my first gray hair in my head. <laughs> oops, oops, oops. Time is going on very quickly. Um, when reviewing literature, you know that you read, and, and they have said it before, that the main reason to vitrify your eggs is the lack of partner. In that moment, when I realized those things, I had a relationship. I was not very comfortable in that relationship, but it was my relationship, well, well. So it was not my, my, my problem in that moment. Um, the other thing that literature says is that the, the first way that woman knows about egg preservation is uh, thanks to the friends, and it was not obviously my, 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 my way because I was specialized in this. But in that moment, I started to make education to my friends, to my colleagues, to my family about fertility preservation and about the time and the age of woman. And in that moment, I decided to take control of my time and of my possibilities. It was an inflection point that I have said. And this is copy in this interview um, uh, to women who know that they have a problem of fertility. It is uh, really brilliant to say or to, to reflect that we have changed our mind. M women have changed our mind. Because if you know that you have a problem, or maybe you are going to have a problem in your fertility, you may be good priorities than having a, ch a child before planned. You also think about preser preserve your fertility. Maybe you have not thought about that before, but in that moment you think about that. And the most important thing is that we have changed our mentality so much that we will not renounce to have children if we have planned and if we want to. But women who want or who think in preserve the fertility are always af afraid and have also fears. And they have to um, explain to the doctors, to the professional, to the nurses, or to their friends, which are the issues, the problems they have, the fears they have. We have problems with, the, with ethics, with moral, with cost, absolutely, and with health. We are afraid about medical and surgery threats, of course. So it is important that the professional explain to us um, how we sit and that it is a quite, quite, uh, quite not risk, riskless uh, proceed. This is me. After my second retrieval, I was a wake up very funny. So a friend of me um, um, recorded me, <laughs> and well, I, I wanted to, to share it with, with you. So I, I wanted to, to explain that I, I had to experience in this. I, my first time, I vitrified my ex at the age of 33, when I was not very sure about my life, my personal life. Then my life improved. But many years ago, three years ago, th three years later, sorry, I, my career started to de develop very fast, so I decided to repeat. The, the first time was nice, and the second time was exactly the same, the same, um, the same situation. So it is important for patients and for professionals to know pros and cons of these treatments, and we have to explain it very carefully, and we, as patients, we have to know them very well.
In the weakness, you, you have to know that professionals have not any biomarkers to measure fertility. We only have biomarkers to <coughs> measure egg reserve, ovarian reserve, which are not the same. It is important to explain and to be very careful in this, to explain that baby is not warranted with this kind of treatments. And it is important to, to show and to know, as they have said before, that uh, return rate, the women who are going to use these eggs is very low, more, more than 6%, 7%, but not much more. In the threats, you have to know that this kind of treatment is very low cost effectiveness, even more if you don't return to use the, your eggs. All, but um, no patient who have vitrified the eggs uh, regret that. And you have to know also in threats that there are low, but real, low, but real medical and surgery uh, risk that you have to explain to the patient. In the strength, um, there is, as reported, a very great uh, uh, rate of dough in these oversights, and they are working exactly the same as fresh one as reported in literature. And if young, as they have said, if you vitrify when you are young, good egg quality is assumed. Um, that means with low abnormality, chromosomal abnormalities, so high rate of future in success only if you vitrify when you are young. In the opportunities, you have, as a woman, more time to decide, more time to develop, more time to travel, more time to make your life whenever you prefer, more time to be ready. And in the future, maybe you can avoid your, uh, to, to have to use egg donation in future. So, if one of you asked me now if, was, if it was worth it, I would say, absolutely it was. If you ask me if I could repeat the experience, as you know, I have repeated it. And I could repeat it more times if necessary. And if one of you ask if I could recommend this kind of treatment to my partner, to my colleagues, to my family, I said, of course, why not? My colleagues, all of my female colleagues in the clinic are vitrified. My sister is the, the very first patient I vitrified in my life, so yes, I could because this experience empowered myself, empowered me, and empowered the, the, the female, the, the, the woman around me. And I wanted to show that this um, feelings in this letter that I have written to me, my future to myself now, it is um, showed in the web page that is gonna be um, uh, shown later by Sarah. Um, and I wanted to point this, uh, the, the red lights here. So I vitrify my ex because I wanted to decide about my, my decision and um, I feel, I feel in that moment, I felt very proud of me. And in the future, I will feel, feel very proud of my decision also, because I can continue with my life and take my own decision without explanations to the others. So just to summarize, for me, and this is not my uh, sentence I have copied from Dr. Griffo in New York, uh, vitrify is not a requirement. It's not mandatory. It's just an option. It is not a promise, and you have to know. It is a hope. And just to conclude, finally, there is no doubt in my mind that it was completely worthwhile. Thank you very much. Wow. Powerful stuff indeed. And I think it's so important to hear from a patient. We're just particularly lucky that in this case, our patient happens to be the ultimate <coughs> informed patient. So, just to tell you what the Be Ready Whenever You're Ready campaign, about which, of course, you have more information in your packs, is about. It is sponsored by Gideon Richter, but really importantly, this is completely unbranded, it's impartial, it's balanced, it's support, it's information, it's exactly what our young people should be getting when they're in school, but of course, so many women are not having. They are bombarded, as we've already heard, with messages in the media which are unrealistic. So let's have a think 
about what we can offer. It was inspired because there has been a rise in interest. We've heard from Professor Joyce Harper that it was only 12 years ago that we first started looking at this procedure, and it's only six years ago that we're saying we no longer need to consider it as being experimental. So the idea of social or, again, non-medical egg freezing has sparked huge debate in the media. And not remotely surprisingly, it has also sparked enormous amounts of misinformation. Every time a 63-year-old single woman gives birth to a baby, there's an enormous amount of interest, yes, because this is suddenly something that a brave new world woman can aspire to. But it's also the fact that this suddenly is something which is not just applicable to women who have medical problems. And as we've heard from our previous presentation, women very much overestimate their likelihood of getting pregnant, uh, particularly as they get older. Suddenly, however, this, because it's a non-medical procedure, is something which is relevant to all of them. So it is very much a 21st century campaign, and it uses 21st century tools. We're encouraging women to think about their fertility journey, and really importantly, we are encouraging them not to leave it too late. So often the day you start to think about it is the month it becomes much less successful. If we can get women to start thinking about it earlier, then they can make that informed choice. This is impartial, it's objective, and we're giving factual answers to the questions that women may have. So, because we're living in the 21st century, of course, so much of this is online. Of course it is. The fertilitychoices.com website is aiming to provide a balanced information, but striking the right balance between giving all the information there being really comprehensive, but not being full of jargon. Yes, of course you're experts and we gave you the very scientific background. The information will be there, but it will be written in a much more user-friendly form. And it's going to put the conversation about egg freezing, understandably, but comprehensively. There's video content, there's stories from real women. We've got that wonderful letter to my future self that we saw there from Elisa, and I would encourage you to go and have a find, uh, go and talk about it. But really importantly, this conversation guide for your initial consultation on egg freezing. Actually, that initial consultation is probably not at the stage where you've reached the fertility clinic, where you have the psychologist, you have the midwife, you have the fertility expert. That conversation may well be about your discussion with your GP or perhaps with your friends. Is your initial consultation going to be the one that you have with your sister, as we heard from Elisa? So we want to make it really important, uh, really importantly, that women feel empowered. They don't go into this conversation feeling at a disadvantage because they are not a healthcare expert. So we've also been building an online community. They, the team are delighted that they have already got over 10,000 followers. This changed in the two weeks running up. We went from nearly 10,000 to over 10,000, which is a great position to be in. So the social media channels that link to the website, they're proving a very effective way of engaging. Of course they are. This is a computer literate generation. My daughter knew far more, I think, about IT by the age of five than I will ever know, I strongly suspect. But the Facebook page is giving a platform for women to share their experiences, to share their stories, and to ask questions about egg freezing and receive sensible answers. And the very recently launched Be Ready Instagram page, that's driven further traffic to the website, and there's been significant engagements with posts. So, funnily enough, the Facebook one is www.facebook.com forward slash be ready whenever you are ready, forward slash. And Instagram is instagram.com, be ready fertility, all with underscores between them. So there have been some additional assets, and they've been launched to help educate those women. As I say, what you need to know about your first consultation, both having that first discussion, putting you in a good stage, but also taking it really simply, breaking it down into six key steps in that animation video, from that first consultation with the doctor right up to the stage where those eggs are retrieved, and finally, the process of freezing your eggs for your future. 
And then again, that letter to my free future self. So these letters are, follow not just one, but several interviews with women who've undergone the egg freezing process. And they are all about where they want to see themselves in eight, 10 years from now, because there is hope. It doesn't buy certainty, but it certainly buys hope. And finally, this is where we are. Yes, so far we're in three countries, Belgium, Italy and Spain, but there are already plans to branch out very, very quickly. And certainly I look forward very much to seeing it coming to a website in England near me very soon. We want to raise awareness. We want women to be in control. There have already been media rewards. The campaign has only been going for just over a year, but it's already gaining recognition across those healthcare awards, having been nominated for two awards, Best Use of Insight, and film and animation for video. But it's also being looked at for excellence in communication. This is very much a 21st century problem. We've seen in the last 20 years alone, there has been a huge shift in the average age at which women are having their babies and a huge shift in the issues that they have, the problems they perceive, the financial, the social, the partnership, the not being prepared to compromise, but also there's been a huge shift in the potential solutions. And that is what this campaign is all about. So, it only remains for me to offer you now the opportunity to move on and ask any questions to our expert panel. Perhaps I could start by asking Elisa, how did you first have the conversation with your professional colleagues, all those ones who have now gone on to undertake vitrification themselves? To my colleagues, yeah, well, they, they work with me, and they say they, they yeah. see everything the real problem of age. So it's easy to explain to my colleagues in the center to vitrify. It is more difficult to my friends, doctors or not doctors. It is more difficult because they say, "Oh, this is not my this is not my issue. This is not my problem. It's gonna. It is not not going to happen to me." But you ha sometimes you feel that it is a little bit uncomfortable for them to talk about that. Many days ago, I, I talked to my uh, personal trainer, which is 30, and I said, OK, are you thinking about that? And she said, of course, but not now. It is not my problem. And I said, why don't you think about this? And she get a little bit angry, and the sport was harder. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, OK. <laughs> OK, we have finished the conversation. <laughs> so. Um, Sometimes it's a little bit uncomfortable to talk about yeah. that. And I, I think that's a real issue. Do you find that the women coming in to see you are more open about it, or do they, do they still feel embarrassed, maybe? Well, the, the ones that come, uh, they, they want to talk about it, because they, the problem is that they have no information. And I mean, not, not no information, but not easy to find information. And it's mainly biased, what they see. So the, the main complaint is that no one told them. And I heard this before. They say, why no one told me? Because I'm 38, I'm young, I can have a baby at any time. Say, so you're young, but your ovaries are not that young. Yeah. And in the annual checkup, the gynecologist never mentions anything. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine, I have my period every 28 days, so no problem. No, the quantity and quality we know is different. So, so they, they have to have this either training when they're very young or more information like this campaign that it's been done. So the information, balance information is there. It's very interesting in the UK. I don't know if you know a consultant called Beulah Bewley, who is very big in fertility in the UK. She's a wonderful woman. She wrote, she wrote a piece a few years ago, which made it into the media, all about how women have to start being realistic. And they have to accept that at the age of 35, then you know we would love it if it was not the case. But the simple fact of the matter is that biology is against you at that stage. And because I work as a doctor for the BBC and I do a lot of commentary on medical problems, I was called upon so often to respond because the answer and the questions I was always asked are, is this, does this woman hate women? You know, we finally have emancipation. We finally have control of our lives. And suddenly she's telling us that we have to be tied to the biological clock again. It was extraordinary, the anger that this generated, the idea that we are giving this news. There's, there are lots of articles in the press you will find, um, and other 
uh, women that are saying this is all an evil plot yeah. uh, to ruin our careers and to ruin put us our back lives. in the kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> but to put put us back, um, and it's not true. I've, 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 there's a professor from the US, not, not, not in science, and she says it's, it's not true. Your fertility at 38 is a few percent less than your fertility at 28. And she's writing a book about it. She's very vocal, um, Professor Twenge. Um, and uh, yeah, this gets <coughs> out there. And, and women see celebrities having children much later. And it makes the denial even more of an issue yeah. because this is what they are being bombarded with. Yeah. So we have a problem. So you had some questions, I believe? Oh, thank you. I am interested in um, uh, stories, I mean, uh, pas patients' uh, stories. Uh, I would like that uh, we, we listen it, uh, to the, the story of the uh, Spanish doctor. Sorry, I don't remember your name, but I, I have it. And uh, I would like to listen to other stories uh, about patients that have made this choice and then maybe that had the baby. And I think that any of the doctor here can uh, mention some patient uh, uh, that can say something interesting. Mm. Two things, one good and one maybe not so good. The good one is uh, the, what, the conversation that you had with patients often, and this happened with a particular patient who's a notary. She had no partner. She thought about freezing all sides because of the lack of partner, like, like most of the patients that we see in the clinic. and. The way she explained is that, you know, she goes to a party or dinner, she meets a guy, and she said to me, said, I don't want to meet this guy again for the second time, and in the second date, start thinking maybe this guy could be the father of my kids. So this pressure, that she was 36 by then, and she said, I want to freeze the oocytes for that. So she froze the oocytes, and she came back one year later, pregnant with the partner. So as soon as the pressure goes off, yeah. Life goes back to normality. Then you find a partner or not. Then you get pregnant or not. But it's not that you, you are induced to that. The other thing I wanted to mention is that about the overestimation of the possibilities. Because we, we have frozen all sides for more than 5,000 patients already, or women, I'd say. Mean age of this group of women, it's 38. So it's way too late. That means that this is a, a, a distribution, so we have patients freezing at 42, 43, even 44. And we try to say it's not a good time. We, we try to uh, discourage women to freeze all sides. But the conversation with the patient is, OK, why not? Well, because the chances of success are very low. What is very low? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe 1%. So 1% is more than zero. I want to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And this happens daily. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions you had? So my name is Nora. Um, I'm 38. I am married uh, since two years, in a relationship since 10 years. And I have a question. What do you tell to women like this who have no idea if they want to have a child? Wow, that's a great question. So I, uh, the same as what I would tell the 30-year-old woman. Um, yes. But that they, they need to understand, you, you need to understand 38, unfortunately, that um, your fertility is, is really decreasing. There's no other way. I'm not going to um, make it sound better. Um, so you have to realize you have the same choices. You either have a child now, you wait, um, or you freeze your eggs. But now, as we've said today, freezing eggs at 38 has lost a lot of quality and quantity of those eggs. But so it is still much better than the 42. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, this, oh, yes. so, so the answer is... I still have if, four years. It, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. So the months, answer is months. have a serious conversation and think first. And if you decide it's not for you, then it's not for you. But what if at the age of 50 you realize that you missed something? You've missed it. That's, not, that's my last slide. Oh, my God, I've got to have kids. Uh, that, and that's it. There's nothing we can do. We, we can't work miracles. There's nothing we can do. And there may, in the future, we may be able to make eggs and stem cells from our skin or from other means. But at this moment in time, we have no other option. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're okay. Christophe, do you have any patients you'd like to well, share with us? Well, maybe a, a recent story of a patient who, uh, who came to the clinic and who, um, who was 35, if I recall well, when she uh, froze her oocytes. And now, three years later, then, she came back to the clinic 
she found her uh, her prince on on the white horse <laughs> and uh, the problem was that he had a severe andrological problem so there was a need oh. of doing a fertility treatment per definition so they they tried a couple of months but they they knew from before that there was a male uh, fertility problem and then she said yeah what is what am i going to do now i am three years later, so she was 38 when she came to the hospital, what am I going to do? Am I going to thaw my oocytes or am I going to do a regular IVF and ICSI yeah. uh, treatment? And actually there is no real data about okay. what to do here. Should we thaw the oocytes? We did an IVF attempt because she was only 38 <laughs> and, and she still had a good ovarian reserve. So she got pregnant now with her own oocytes of that IVF treatment. So the oocytes are still frozen. The 35-year-old oocytes are still frozen. So maybe these oocytes could be used at a later stage when she might want a second baby. I just want to stress as well, what we have said is very general with regards to the numbers. And every woman is individual. So some women will go through the menopause at 45, some well into their 50s. And that does affect how fertile they are. We've heard a lot of people mention ovarian reserve. So we are individual. And some women will still get pregnant at 42, 43, but some won't. And it's just women being informed of that information. So you still might be able to get pregnant, but you need to think about it. <laughs> no, and, and linking to that, I think also um, we, we know, we're fully aware that many of these women that freeze oocytes will never use them. Yeah. They just want to have them there just in case. And some of them will get pregnant spontaneously, some of them may come back to use it. At, up today, it's only 12% of women that freeze that come back, so one, one out of 10 more or less. And probably the immense majority will say, well, I just froze them, I, I was relaxed, I did it. Yeah and I never needed them, so there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that's a really key message on which to end. No, this is not for everyone. If it is for you, it should be for you as early as possible. Although there is that window of opportunity, as Juan pointed out, between the age of 30 and 35, because if you freeze your eggs at 22, you are much less likely ever to use them. But Women need to be informed. Should we start the conversation early? Yes. When is too early? I would say kindergarten. <laughs> but anything <laughs> after that is a good time to start thinking about fertility. <clears throat> and we need to stop the taboo. We need to make it OK in the same way that 20 years ago, women were embarrassed if they met a partner on an online dating site. And now it's a badge of honor. I think that we should be moving towards the stage where women talk about egg freezing and it is no longer socially perhaps unacceptable or something about which they should feel embarrassed. It is just one of their options. But in order to be one of their options, in order to free those women, we need to be having that conversation. I am delighted that we have had the conversation today, but I'm particularly delighted that this will give us the opportunity to spread the word through the website and of course, for you to spread the word to. If women are going to have the best options, they need to have informed options. I'm very grateful to our panel for helping all of us to understand what those options are. And I would like, of course, to thank Gideon Richter, who have sponsored today, and to thank you for coming and wish you a very enjoyable rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>